All right. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to get ourselves started for planning the big exit webinar presentation by Mr. Tom Spadia from Spadia Liana Franchise Attorneys. We have a wonderful size group in today, so we're going to get ourselves started. We're going to ask you to please open up your chat boxes so you can be able to ask questions throughout the presentation. We're going to do our best to answer them throughout the different slides, and if need be, we'll answer them rapid fire at the end. So definitely make sure you're listening in to see if your question's being answered throughout the presentation. And without further delay, Tom, thank you so much for presenting to everyone today. Great. Well, thank you, Chelsea, for organizing, for setting this up. Um, you know, those of you, I, I've, I've done a version of this presentation in a couple, and it's been pretty, pretty well received. So people had said, hey, you know, maybe we can do this. And then we just, you know, posted that email out. And lo and behold, we have like 150 people signed up. So very, uh, very excited to do that. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and share my screen. And um, Tom, did you want to do the polls real quick? Oh, that's true. So before I do that, see, that's why we have Chelsea here. Um, <laughs> so uh, so the first step is, and for those of you who, who you know, know me or, or new to this, uh, I'm Tom Spady. I'm a franchise attorney. You know, we represent franchisors in all different various stages of their growth. And, you know, the key to our practice and key to our philosophy is start with the end in mind. And so we're always sort of trying to structure everything around you know, where does this thing end up? And, you know, fortunately, we've had a number of clients exit uh, over the past couple of years, or the past year, really. And we've also represented some groups that have bought franchises and it sort of structured our thinking about what are people looking for? And that is sort of the, the, the golden eggs of the people in franchising. So to kind of structure today's meeting, it would be helpful for me to get a sense um, of sort of who is in the audience as people join. So we have a couple of poll questions to just kind of give us a sense of where people are. So if you guys could just kind of take a set, set and, and, uh, and answer these, it'll give us a sense of, of who the audience is so we can uh, make sure we don't miss anything. And as Chelsea mentioned, you know, we're, you know, we're not with, with 150 people, we have turned the mics off or it'll get kind of out of control, but um, feel free to ask your questions. We want to keep this interactive, so drop things in the chat, and then you know Chelsea can either you know read those off uh, to me, and we'll kind of keep the pace going. So if something kind of jumps out and you want to have this discussion, um, go ahead and uh, ask it. So that's great. So you see the poll clipping up here, and it seems like there's you know a lot of new franchisors, which is really terrific, right? And I know we have a number of clients here, and um, and some other franchisors, so. Um, that's great because this is really structured towards uh, franchisors, emerging brands. In fact, I think the great majority of people on here are um, in that zero to 50 units. And, you know, no better time to plan your exit than, than in the beginning. And founders and co-founders, you know, really have to think about this stuff and drive. So very cool. We'll, we'll, we'll let that go for a, for a minute here. Um, all right, I'm going to dive in as we finish up that poll. So this is good. I have my screen sharing. Let me know if this. I'll let you know as soon as we see it. Perfect. Looking good. Good. Fantastic. Well, as we say, planning the big exit, right? I mean, that's the, uh, that's the key to why a lot of people get into, into franchising to really start thinking about that. And as I mentioned, as I see people here, I mean, the majority of the people on this presentation are founders and new franchisors, which is always which is always exciting. And also, it's sort of spread. We have a number of people thinking, hey, uh, in the next two years exit, but also people, and I, I love it that there's also people never, I plan on dying at my desk. Now, I'm not sure. There might be a couple of suppliers and attorneys on here that might have answered that um, as well, because that's sort of my exit plan. But uh, but that's, you know, that's part of it. And, and I think we're even going to touch on legacy and to families and things like that. And, and I always frame it. If you're building your business for a potential suitor, that is advantageous, even if you never really go through the transaction, because the more valuable your company is, the cleaner it is, you know, you're still going to have other stakeholders, you have franchisees. You have bankers, you have, you know, key employees, and the more disciplined you are, the more you run this business as a semi-public company, the better uh, the value, the better run it's going to be, and the more you're going to be able to achieve your mission, right? I mean, that's kind of the goal. So here's what we're going to go through. You know, we're going to talk about franchise valuations, and, and that's a big issue, and that's a big thing, and it's exciting, and the numbers have really exploded, and I want to go through some of the factors 
in you know my opinion, my humble opinion, uh, and what I've seen of what really is the drivers of that, and then obviously what you can do, um, you know, to continue driving that. And then what are the buyers looking for? I mentioned, you know, the last year or two, uh, we've spent a considerable amount of uh, time and energy in our practice, both representing buyers and sellers of systems. So we've gotten a really kind of unique view into what are they really looking for? What, what is that that they need? And then you have this trend, this kind of platform play in franchising that a lot of people are familiar with. You know, brands who are getting into the business and taking a lot of smaller brands and creating these kind of platforms. It's, you know, you go to some of these broker shows and you see, wow, there's some brand, they have a lot of different things here. So I want to just talk about that and the reasoning for that and whether or not that could be a fit, the, the good and bad of that. And also the, the smaller systems. It's just amazing how down market, I mean, a few years back, people wouldn't even look at a brand unless there was a certain level of, you know, million dollars plus or $3 million plus of EBITDA. That's really changed. Uh, people have really gone, gone down market. So let's talk about what drives franchisor valuation. And as I mentioned at the top, you want to start with the end in mind. So, you know, for those of you who are thinking in the next two years or, or beyond, let's say the, for the other folks, you know, when you're thinking about valuations, um, what is it that drives? I mean, the valuations that we are seeing now are, you know, 15, 20 times earnings in some cases, um, <clears throat> which is, you know, what is that? Well, I think one is its rarity. I mean, we did a we did sort of a deep dive of trying to get a sense of how many franchisors. I think there's between four and 5,000 franchisors. Depends who you ask and how you define it. You know, people actively selling franchises, but you know, it's, it's under 5,000. Of those brands, I think there's only about a hundred of them that are over a thousand units. So there's just not that many brands that have really made it to the, the stratosphere. And then I also, we also kind of did a, an estimate that there's really only about a thousand brands out there who are over a hundred units. So when you really start thinking about that, right, how big franchising is a multi-billion dollar industry. And if there's only a thousand brands that have even gotten over a hundred units, they're rare. There's probably more buyers than there are necessarily um, great franchises to buy, by a lot, right? Every time that you have that. So that just creates this rarity classic supply and demand, when those things intersect, it's going to drive up valuations. And the other thing is time. And, and this is something that I don't think we spend enough time, bad pun there, uh, to use and energy on, is that the amount of time it really takes to build a good franchisor. And for those founders, those people who answered never plan on dying at my desk, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It just takes time. It takes a tremendous amount of time. So you can come into this business and, you know, those veterans like, like me who've been in franchising a long time, I've seen it. People come into the market, they spend a ton of money, they hire all the development people, they get all these folks in, they get all the suppliers, and then they start. And then they realize that franchising is has a whole heck of a lot to do with franchisees. And that has to do a lot with relationships. And you just can't force that, you know. So uh, like a fine wine, like a lot of good things in life, like a family, relationships, time, children, you just can't rush it. So I think what happens is, especially in Wall Street, especially the sort of non-franchise people, they look at these, you know, quick ROIs. How can I put in? You can put a billion dollars into the business and you can't build a strong franchise system out of the gate because it's about relationships. It's about franchisees being successful. It's a feedback loop. It's opening your first units and having that feedback and saying what worked, what didn't work. A lot of what franchisees are buying when they join your system, I believe they're not just buying your successes. They're buying your failures. They're buying the things that didn't work. They're buying that scar tissue. They're buying, in fact, time because you've spent maybe five years in business and you are 10 years in business or 15 years in business and you've learned what it takes for a franchisee to be successful. You've learned the misses. You've learned what marketing programs work, what supply chains work, and all of these different things that you just are intuitive to you because they're part of your system. That's why people are joining these systems and, and coming in, and you just can't rush that. So whenever you have this long factor, so be patient, right? No, no one's writing you, by the way, in, in a big picture, I'll, I'll say this now, no one's writing you a $20 million check if they don't think they can double that. So you got to always remember that the longer you can wait, the longer that process goes, the more valuable 
you become. And of course, that speaks to the third point, scalability, right? That's, that's sort of the obvious one in franchising. I think franchisors are valued a lot closer towards software companies. In fact, I actually think franchising is sort of like analog software. It's software not run by programming, but run by humans because you create something. You know, think of the first person that took an Uber drive. How much energy went into having the map, having the drivers, having that? Well, those of you who have muscled through your first few franchisees, think of the tremendous effort it took to get the system in place and get those franchisees profitable and get them moving forward. And so when I talk to people, maybe they own, you know, three or four restaurants and they want to franchise their business or three or four, you know, roofing companies, you say, look, it's definitely easier to open the fourth and fifth and sixth company. You'll make a higher profit if you do that corporately, but you're going to run out of cousins and you're going to run out of general managers. And at some point you're going to hit this inflection. And the beauty of franchising is the curve is reversed. It's a lot harder to open your first couple of franchises, but once you get to 15, 20, 25, incrementally done well, each of those units becomes easier to open than the last one. And so you create this ecosystem and that drives value because someone can come in and say, okay, you've done the hard work like software. It's a lot less expensive to add extra users on the back end. You should think about franchising in the same way. And that's one of the main reasons why you see these valuations of 10, 12, 15, 20 times earnings. So what are they looking for, right? When you're thinking about that, you know, you're thinking, okay, well, this is rarity. There's a scalability factor. They've put in the time. Okay, I'm a private equity company. I want to come in here and I want to write a very big check so I can get my return on investment for my investors. But what are they looking for? They're looking for predictability, right? I mean, you, any financial model as a finance major in college spent a lot of time around private equity folks. It's all about risk. Risk reward, right? That's a, that's a curve. That math guys can draw out. And what drives risk, especially perceived risk, is unknowns. And of course, this goes to that planning of the big exit, right? This is all a preview to what you need to be thinking about as a buyer. Just like when you sell a franchise, you have to put yourself in the shoes and have empathy, well, really, when you sell anything. Well, I implore you as owners and founders, when you're thinking about exiting, you have to put yourself in the shoes of these private equity systems or strategic buyers or multi-brands. Well, what they're looking for, what they're nervous about is, is risk. And they're nervous about predictability. Is this model sustainable? Do we know what's happening there? Yeah, I know it's your cousin and you have a handshake deal, but that doesn't really necessarily translate. And is it translatable? So the unit economics, um, that also goes towards predictability. If your franchisees, even though most systems, you're paying off of the top, but if there's not strong unit economics of your franchisees, and I'd even say that the books of your franchisees are more important than the books of your franchisor, because it gives you predictability. If they're losing money, if they're breaking even, if they're turning over, you now no longer have predictable cash flow. You have a lot of risk that that money's going to go over. So all of these things, all of these bucket points that people talk about, they all fit into a nice, neat schedule of this is what's that predictability of cash flow and the potential to grow. So when you when you know when we look at it for clients of the firm, um, you know you'll you'll recognize this next. Oops, sorry, um, system is that we have a system up here, and it, and it can be anybody's system. You know this is obviously educational, but you need to track this stuff. You need to be showing your buyers that you're buttoned up, that you have your state registrations done that when someone buys a franchise, you can go all the way back. You can go all the way back to um, your, you can go all the way back to trace every franchise agreement sold exactly through where you have a receipt page. So can you? I mean, that would be a question that I would ask you, but we do. If our clients are looking for someone or someone says, hey, I wanna do a pre-due diligence on my own system. Can you take every franchise agreement and go all the way back to the receipt page? show that that receipt page was signed in a state that you were legally allowed to sell, and then also back up that you were legal. You can show that paper trail because that's what people are really looking for. You know, do you have these filings? Was it done? Do you have the spousal guarantees? Do you have every person? Do you have the conditional assignment of lease? This pile of paperwork, that due diligence, you know, a lot of people always say, 
hey, we're going to worry about this, you know, in case we have a problem with a franchisee, right? We're well, you know, we're only going to have a problem with, you know, hopefully it's a couple percent. I don't even, I believe you can go through franchising without ever being sued by your franchisees. It's my philosophy. Um, if you announce a prevention, but you don't come, you don't build a compliance system because you're afraid of a fight with your franchisee. You build a compliance system because 100% of your agreements are going to be looked at. Trust me, we do it on behalf of firms. They take the franchise agreement, they look for the, now look, I know a lot of people, if you've been emerging, but it's a lot better to know what you have, that you can point to something, that you can say, hey, here's what we have and, and we've done this, as opposed to them finding that out. So you should be aware that if you're going through this process, Someone is going to want to show your franchise agreement, track to a receipt page, track to a state registration, because that's the basics. Because as I said, if it's your cousin who brought the franchise or your friend who brought the franchise, a private equity firm, for them, that doesn't matter to them because they're not going to necessarily, they're not necessarily going to um, trust that. They're going to say, hey, on this piece of it, there's risk. We don't actually have it all buttoned up. So we're not sure that it's going to go through. So those of you who are thinking about that within next two years, that was about a third of the, of the participants today, you should be doing this due diligence on yourself. It's much better. In fact, there are firms even that will do sort of due diligence on your franchisees. Find out it's better to address holes in your system. And look, I love entrepreneurs. I'm an entrepreneur. My dad was an entrepreneur. I get it. When the beginning, you go really fast, you break a lot of dishes, things are a little messy, and you start sort of getting, I mean, if you didn't have that energy, you wouldn't have built a franchise system. So that's okay. There's an expectation that you're going to have some of these holes, but isn't it better to deal with that upfront to say, hey, it's kind of like having your FDD. If you've had a loss, if you have an issue, if you have a hole, deal with it deal with the objection. If it's going to kill the deal, know that early. And so you say, hey, look, this is where we're at. These are the things. And you know, maybe you can rectify it. Maybe you can get some releases from franchisees. There are things you can do so that when you really go to market and you really go to the dance and they go through it, um, you're ready. So I, I flipped there to this trend of multi-brand systems. Once again, they're doing that same. In fact, that. To some level, it's harder if you're if you're selling to a group that really understands franchising and really understands systems and is buttoned up, and you're not quite as organized as you you feel you should be. Um, for those systems, you know you really you really should be ready to go. So why do they do that? It's obvious, right? Back office cost savings. They're going to leverage industry relationships, and there's a great growth opportunity. One of a couple of deals that that we saw happen with some of our clients the biggest payoff for everybody. Now, first of all, a lot of these multi-brand systems for founders will keep the founder as a piece of that business. So these are not just one and done, sell the business, walk away. A lot of them, the founder stays on as the voice of the brand, the face of the brand, and has a chance of a second bite at the apple, which is a really nice value proposition. You know, this business can now double again and you can stay in for 20%, with a lot less risk, you take some of the chips off the table and, and that's good. But I will tell you, if you're a founder, you should be very realistic about how happy you're going to be in these environments. And I've had many kind of coaching conversations with that. You're a founder. You're used to just, you know, sort of, what is it? You know, um, aim, aim point fire. I forget what the thing is. Fire first, right? Just fire. Just get out there. You're an entrepreneur. That's what entrepreneurs do. So you just have to recognize that on that piece of it. But there's a big opportunity. And what a lot of times happens is it's a big opportunity for your franchisees. There's also a lot of fear and apprehension when you go to market and you go into one of these bigger systems, your franchisees are going to get nervous. It's manageable. It happens sometimes the franchisees are actually happy. You know, you've built this business up. We're at 50 units. We're just kind of pushing these things together. And we're really, and they know that maybe there's some software investment. Maybe there's some sophistication that can come in. And for some of your high-performing franchisees, this can actually be a good thing as opposed to just apprehension. So don't, don't think it's necessarily going to be all bad. For one is there's growth opportunities. You know, let's say you're a service brand. And, you know, you're crushing it. We're in Philadelphia. You're crushing it in Philadelphia and you've sort of maximized it. You don't necessarily want to 
extend your geography and you get bought by one of these you know, multi-brand systems and some of your franchisees can now turn around and potentially buy some franchises of that. And that's a huge leverage point for growing both brands because then their other brands can now take on your brand and fill in some of your holes. So, so there's a lot of opportunities there that, uh, that make sense. And for those of you not in the multi-brand system, you got to up your game. You know, franchising is getting professionalized. There's a certain expectation. I mean, that's why we've invested so much money in our backend systems and in our software and in our transparency, because we know that franchising is getting more and more professionalized. Just, you know, grabbing a template and sort of making it up and having a foot in the door and halfway in, that is not going to get you. There's a lot of competition out there. So you really have to up your game uh, in terms of what that system looks like. So well, another thing we like to talk about is the sort of uh, life cycle of franchising is to understand where you are. And some of you obviously, you know, mentioned that. And, and I mentioned this at the top of the talk is that we're seeing firms seeking smaller and smaller systems. In fact, there's some firms who are buying people that are even pre-franchising. And so pre-royalty break even, right? Royalty break even. I always say in franchising, you, 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 you celebrate the day that you're legal to sell franchises and get your FDD. We celebrate that. We launch a lot of brands. It's very exciting. Next huge celebration point, when you sell your first franchise, you award your first franchise. Sorry, I should use my, my own words there. You never sell. You only award because quality of your franchisees is going to dictate your exit. The next biggie is when you get the royalty break even. When your royalty stream gets to, I don't know, 40 grand, 50 grand a month, and that supports your home office and pays your bills, so you theoretically do not need to sell franchises to support your existing franchisees. That's when it gets super exciting in terms of valuation. So I think what a lot of the buyers of franchise systems have woken up to is the enormous, now there's risk there. Like a lot of people who are pre-royalty break even, they never actually make it to royalty break even. But now what I think you're seeing is that they realize that these pre-royalty break even franchisors, some of you may be on this call, you struggle for cash. Because if you don't sell franchises, and then if you're in the broker network where they're taking a chunk away, which, by the way, I think is okay because you're in the royalty business, not the franchise fee business. But if you get to the point, they're looking at that saying, geez, these folks are maybe 12 to 24 months away from royalty break even. They're, they're, they're struggling a little bit with cash flow. We're going to come in there and you know put an equity injection get them over the top, and then they know. The reason they're doing that is because they know that the value proposition from pre-royalty break-even to post-royalty break-even, it's probably the biggest jump because it's hard to justify because you don't get, if you're pre-royalty break-even, you don't have much EBITDA. You maybe have none. You're spending more money than you're actually taking in. And a lot of people get like panicked about that. You know, if you're a, if you're a service business and you're a handyman service or you're a restaurant, if you're spending more money than you're paying or you're a gym and you're spending more money than you're taking in in revenue, you are going to be out of business pretty quickly because there's no path towards um, scalability. Franchising is different, right? That's the other big thing. And I'm you know, mostly veterans on this call and franchising. So you understand that. But remember, you're not in your core business. Franchising is a different industry. And understanding that is also to then understand that exit. And so these PE firms understand that. They understand that you're closer to the software business than you are to, you know, the service business. So, you know, they're going to look at, sometimes they're going to look at gross royalty valuations as they don't necessarily care about your EBITDA as much as they used to. That's been my experience. Maybe some people would debate me on that. But I, the reason for that, go back to the systems buying systems or the, you know, the, the, the multi-brand systems. The reason for that is they have their own cost structure. They have their franchise development. They have their accounting. They have their executive team. They even have their field staff. They know how many people can support it. So from their standpoint, they're thinking, we're really buying the royalty stream. We're, you know, if you're a 10% profit, 40% profit, 70% profit, if you're a 70% profit, you're probably not supporting your franchisees enough. So we don't even care about that EBITDA. We care about your gross royalty. That's what we're valuing the company on. And we care about the, the EBITDA of your franchisees. So when you start thinking about this preparing for your exit, um, one thing I have seen trip up a lot of deals. And so if you walk away with one nugget is when you your suitor says, 
Show me the unit economics of your franchisees. If that is all over the map, totally scattered, you don't have that organized, you don't have good reports, and you can't rattle off the range and say, you know, this guy in Cincinnati is underperforming in his food cost, and this gal in Chicago is overperforming on, you know, their occupancy cost. If you don't know that, or someone on your team or someone in your professional orbit doesn't know that, that's going to affect your valuations. You really need to understand the business model of your franchisees. And so, you know, where you are in that life cycle is going to determine valuation. As you drive on that wheel, as you go up the wheel towards maturity, past royalty break even, the valuation is going to continue to increase because you will have proven the model. You know, you lose a lot of franchisors. Hopefully it doesn't happen to anybody here. If you've made it to probably this call, you're probably past that survivor point. But there's been, you know, a lot of studies of 20% of franchisors really make it up towards that royalty break even. That means 80% don't. Doesn't mean they fail. Your business is better. You know, you figured out how to teach someone how to be in your business. You know, the teacher knows, knows the subject better than the student sometimes. So just being a franchisor makes you a better business person. But you may not get to this point uh, where you're doing that. So I think the big takeaways, know the unit economics of your franchisees. Have your paperwork organized. Be able to put your hands on every franchise agreement, every receipt page, every piece having to do with the state registrations, because these are unknown risks that are going to drive down valuation. Build your deal room before you ever go to market. Know what your franchisees are saying about you. Do this pre-due diligence and stay organized and recognize that you know you have some you have some good value. If you've gotten to this point, um, you are in a rare class, and as being in a rare class, you know, you should be in, you should be in pretty good, good shape. So questions, anybody have any questions they want to hop into the chat? We actually got two thus far already, Tom, and both Great. of them are very similar. So how much should you invest in a pre-royalty times in order to make it through to post-royalty? And is there any kind of formula? You know, it's a great question. Um, you know, I don't think there's a formula. It's not formulaic. I think, I think you have to think about it in terms of subsidies, right? Your, your, your franchisor is your kid with a huge amount of potential, but you got to pay for the dance classes. You got to get them ready. You got to bring them to ballerina school and you're betting on the fact that they're going to get the gold medal. And so you just, you, you have to think that your core business is subsidizing that. So for us, you know, if you have that core business and that's paying your bills and, and that's, you know, doing well, it's going to take some time, but it can take a few hundred thousand dollars of, and as you bring in franchises, you just reinvest in that. So obviously the more money you invest, the faster you're going to get there. So I don't know that it's a formula, but, um, but I would say that, you know, you, you should be thinking it, it's going to take you a little while. And so if you can subsidize your lifestyle and your cash flow through whatever business you franchise. Most founders of franchisors have their core business. Use that and 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 have that kind of bleed some money over on an annual basis into the franchisor. Your core business pays for your kids' college. Your franchisor pays for your grandkids' college. That's how you think of it. You're building generational wealth, and so it's a long-term investment with a big hit at the end. Next question. Are the multiples in franchising based on industry or just the franchise industry has its own multiple range? You know, that is a great question. Um, I, I think it's a combination of the two. I think you get, um, I think it's generally the franchise industry has its own multiple. Um, you, you perhaps get a little bit of variance depending on, you know, sometimes very heavily investment items that don't, that, that maybe the country can only hold like 100 or 150 of these units are going to drive down the EBITDA. But whereas if you have units that have a lot of growth, that's another scarcity item that you should really think about as a franchisor. One of the biggest early mistakes that franchisors make is territories that are too large. And, and I understand you want to do a deal and you want to get that but then you have these squatters, and so it, it points to the answer here, is that the valuation starts to get driven down because you start losing territory. So I think that, um, generally speaking, you're talking about um, it's franchising in general because it's, it's a cash flow. It's a licensing business 
intellectual property, you're renting your intellectual property to somebody else, you've taught them how to do that, you lock them up in a long term, and then they pay you a fee and you prevent them from you know, competing against you. That's pretty much what franchising is. Do you think buyers are looking more for the U.S. market or being strong international matters? You know, we're we're domestic. We have a number of firms that are international firms that have um, domestic franchising. Um, it's a whole different animal. You know, you need different lawyers. You need different mindsets. You have to be thinking about uh, masters. You have to be thinking about your intellectual property there. So I guess I'm focused more on the domestic market, but I think buyers... Many times buyers, they're not gonna, they're not gonna pay for the fact that you can go international, but I think you might get a deal done or at least get maybe a small premium, um, although I guess that con contradicts being paid if there is an international opportunity for some of these brands. But for the most part, I think it's mostly domestic. Is there a minimum EBITDA that private equity firms or investors are looking for? You know, there used to be. I mean, I think the more mature ones, the bigger ones, they all have different, you know, a lot of times it's sort of that million dollars was kind of a cutoff point, but I have seen that drop and I have actually seen investments be done with uh, pre-earnings where they actually have zero or negative EBITDA, your pre-royalty break even. So no, I don't think so. Now, the caveat to that is that the less you make, it really is, a, is an exponential growth scale in terms of the valuation. So the further down you are, and even negative, you're not really getting a lot for that business. So the, you know, no one's writing you a check unless they can double or triple it. Always remember that. No one writes you a check unless they can make money off of that. You know, this is business, not charity. How much does the multiple vary for reoccurring revenue versus non-reoccurring revenue models? Oh, I, I think the real, well, the reoccurring revenue model, oh, okay, in terms of the actual model itself. Well, the EBITDA is so high in franchising because it is based on recurring revenue, which is essentially royalty, right? We're in the royalty, we're in that game. We're in the game where you get reoccurring revenue. Um, that just speaks to the earnings of the franchisee. So if you have, a, if your franchisees have a reoccurring revenue model, that just makes it more appealing. It makes them stable. But I don't know that it necessarily affects the valuation if they are, you know, some sort of retail and they figured it out and they know how to get deal flow and they do deals all the time. You know, the, the, the roofer who does a roof every 20 years versus the HVAC service contract. I don't know that it necessarily affects it. You just need to understand that business and your franchisees, they have to make money. So when ready to sell, are there particular brokers or M&A firms that you recommend over others that specialize in franchising? You know, that's a great question. I do think it's very important to get professional help, um, for sure. You don't want to do this alone. It's probably the only time you're going to do it, and it's not the only time they're going to do it. So you're going into a, you're going in to play a game, and you get one at bat, and this pitcher has pitched to a lot of batters. So you want to get professional help, and you want to get a coach who knows how to do that. So I think it really varies. I'd be happy, by the way, to have that conversation with anybody offline. You have my email, my cell phone, reach out to Chelsea. Um, I'd be happy to have that conversation, but um, I think it's very customized. Um, yes, I know a lot of folks out there. And so I think you have to, it's um, not one size fits all. Is it easier to sell a small brand in other countries to get steam going and then selling in America? You know, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I can speak to that. I'm not sure. I think that the key is that, um, you know, selling franchises in America is, you know, a unique model. But if you have a proven brand in another country and you think it translates, no matter how you cut it, it's hard to sell your first couple of franchises, right? The people here who have it um, in America. So I don't know that it's easier or harder. I mean, I, I live here. It's a lot easier for me to, if I was selling a franchise, I could do a much better job in the United States than I could internationally right off the bat. So I guess it all depends on your contacts and the business. So I think it's a very unique, you know, question. How would you suggest a franchisor finds a buyer? Should they consider the usage of a business or intermediary broker? Yes, I think so. I, I think getting a good investment banker and getting an intermediary is going to drive um, I will I will give the word of warning to everybody on this call. You, If you're on this call, you've probably gotten an email or a letter and it's like, hey, you know, our buying group has identified you 
as someone who we might be interested in. You're all getting that letter. They're opening Entrepreneur Magazine and looking at every franchisor or they're going on the list. Everybody's getting that letter. Not, I don't mean to say you're not special. You're very special. You're a franchisor. So, but it's, everybody's getting that letter. So it's much better to have multiple buyers and to go through that process and understand what your value is. Understand what scar tissue you have that you need to clean up, where the problems are, um, and go through this process in a very regimented way and don't rush it because if you rush it, you're going to leave money on the table. So yes, I, I think you should get someone to help list you. Another question is how long does this typically take? Oh, that's a great question. I, I would say it's, it's really about a year process, you know, from, if you say like, Hey, I want to sell the business. I, I think it's a year plus or minus, you know, uh, a little bit. It's, it's not something that can be done in a couple of months. What are some of the biggest mistakes you've seen with people selling? You know, one is thinking that it's going to go really fast. I think that's a mistake. People think that it, the process is going to be pretty quick. And then I think the other biggest mistake is not being realistic about the guys you meet or gals you meet in the trade show or on your first Zoom that you get to sell to like you're selling a franchise are not the people who are going to do the due diligence. So I think not really appreciating just how deep a dive. In fact, I think um, I, I think I had another question here directly to me um, about the due diligence process, which I think it ties into this. You know, the due diligence process. They're going to look at. They're going to do a financial due diligence. They're going to they're going to really vet your earnings. Now, obviously, if you have a good uh, accounting firm, you have audited financial statements. That matters. It matters not only the, the quality of your earnings, but, um, but who your firms are, right? And I, you know, a, a shameless shout out to us. Like you need, they're going to look at your documents. They're going to look at who are your lawyers? Who are your accountants? Who is doing sales for you? Who's your marketing company? All these reputations are all kind of put into the soup. And so, you know, that process, it can take, you know, three to six months. They're going to do a quality of earnings on, the franchisees, you know, how predictable is this earnings? Are your franchisees going to be in business long? Are they struggling or are they growing? Because remember, if your franchisees grow, you pay more royalties and all that sort of fits back in. So I think that's another big piece of it. So I think the mistake is, and recognizing that they're going to talk to your franchisees at some level, they're going to do this due diligence. And if you're not prepared for that, if you're really not prepared, you are going to have to pull more paperwork. I don't know everybody who's gone through like an SBA loan or has ever borrowed money from a bank. And you're like, oh my God, stop asking questions. I can't believe you're going to ask questions. Remember that experience? This is triple. because <laughs> so, so you have to really be prepared that they're going to ask for stuff and um, they're going to keep asking because there's a lot of an analysis. Like I said, they're not guys who paid for law school by and, you know, going to law school at night, hustling, selling franchises during the day. These are like the professionals who are sitting in the, you know, 50th floor in Manhattan or in Philly. And they're all they're thinking about is how do I find the gotchas in the file? So I think the biggest mistake is just not appreciating um, that process. And it's 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 doable. It's manageable. I don't want to scare anybody away from the process. Um, but hey, no one's writing you like a 20 or 30 million dollar check unless they really make sure that they've looked under every rock and they've made sure what those risks are. So I think the biggest mistake is not appreciating that and not really, you know, going through it yourself in advance and being patient and knowing that this is going to take a long time and you have to have emotional fortitude. If you're a founder, you have emotional fortitude. You never would have built the business without emotional fortitude, but you need to recognize that this is going to, you're going to have to dig deep because it's a, it's a stressful process, but um, you know, it's got a nice silver lining at the end for sure. What are the biggest reasons that a franchisor doesn't sell? You know, the biggest reasons in terms of a franchisor uh, getting into the business and then sort of not selling towards the end. I, I think things falling apart in the due diligence. I think that they, you know, it doesn't vet out that there's a problem with their franchisees, that they have problems in their systems that were either undisclosed or unaddressed. And there's some of these latent risks and you have franchisees that are not really happy with you. 
and and you get unrealistic about then what is your your value proposition so and the owner and you know sometimes the owners don't sell i think we go back to rarity sometimes the owners don't sell because you know it's a great business and they're making a lot of money and they like it and i've had a couple owners who i know are worth a lot of money who are clients and you know look i'm happy because they say clients to the firm and they're like eh, i don't think i'm going to sell because what the heck would i do <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, these are a personalities are like, there's only so much golf I can play. So I like what I'm doing. I'm, I'm sort of surrounded by people that I love and I've made successful. And so I think sometimes people don't sell because they're in it for some, you know, look, we, we, we get in the business, obviously, to make money and to support our families. Um, but there's a big part of getting into business to build something that's really great. And there's this, this mission and vision that is just a little bit beyond the balance sheet and the income statement. And for me personally, that's why I love representing founders because I recognize that there's a massive non-monetary part of being a franchisor. You know, you're changing people's lives, you're helping people get in business. And, you know, if you go to the next level, that, that, those, that philosophy and that culture may shift a little bit. Um, there's always an exit. You know, even the person who says, I never, I, I plan on dying at my desk. Well, their heirs will be appreciative that you did a little bit of due diligence because guess what? They're going to sell the business. So at some point we're all exiting the business, either voluntarily or involuntarily. But, um, but I think you just have to, you know, get yourself organized. Well said. Any suggestions on how or where to find buyers? You know, the same thing. I, I think getting an intermediary, you know, um, understanding the market going to some of these trade shows, you know, start talking with your professionals at first. Um, you know, those of you who are our clients, you know, call me up and say, hey, I want to spitball. What's this thing look like? Um, so, you know, your accountant, your lawyer, they're the people to start with and just start talking about it and start going down the road uh, slowly and, you know, don't sign anything until you're ready. But I think it's a, it's not a one-off. It, it, it takes a plan and you have to have a plan to, to exit. Well, we have time for this last question here. Does it make sense to work with an investment banking or coach that is out of franchising? And could you actually be that coach? So I, I, I do appreciate that. Um, you know, we, we act as a sort of pseudo coach uh, for our franchise or clients, right? That's part of what our process is. It's part of our, um, I, I do appreciate the last question is like a tee up as a commercial on me. So I apologize of those who's, who waited to the end to the like drink more Ovaltine. That's what the secret is. But, um, but, you know, but, but yes, I mean, for our clients, those of you, I have a number of clients on this call, you know, that's what our role is, is to be that intermediary, to connect people. So we're not going to be the formal coach. We're not going to bring you to market, but you need to surround yourself with trusted advisors. You need to have trust in that. And so, you know, yes, for our clients, that's exactly what our role is. I mean, we tell people you're going to franchise your business and we start having this conversation. You know, this presentation has, has evolved from individual conversations that I've had with people over the last you know decade that we've been doing this. And now that we see people exiting, we have that conversation right at the beginning and you start driving towards the end of the process. So you need to make sure your professional team is not looking at you transactionally. Look, it's why we don't charge hourly. So that on our screen is why we do our flat fee all in. We come up with a rate. And what we thought of is your legal team, your in-house legal team. We charge that because we want to have these nuanced conversations. You obviously can tell that I'm not like afraid to talk and I don't want you looking at the clock thinking, oh my God, what's this going to cost me? So, you know, we're, we, we do that, but then we're going to make introductions to who is best suited to be that subject matter expert. And, you know, in that sense, we don't have a kind of horse in the fight. We're just, we're there. Uh, to be that coach. So, so I do appreciate that. But if anybody wants to have that conversation, even if you're not a client, I'd be happy to have that conversation and sort of spitball what this thing looks like. You know, that's what we do. So I think you said that was the last question. So I want to, I want to thank everybody. Um, hopefully, you know, you don't get as much feedback when you're not like in person here. So I'm still, uh, although I guess after three years of zoom, we should all be used to it. But, um, but anyway, I, I appreciate everybody. Appreciate all the clients you know, getting to know some of the people really appreciate the amount of questions here. So I, I'm, we're going to, we're going to post this um, as a recording, uh, as you notice. So hopefully people will make it. I think we went 45 minutes with the Q and A, but I think that made it better. So. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you for all the questions. Like Tom said, you can definitely follow us on our socials. You'll be able to see different postings about the recording from today. Thank you so much.